Cinderella was the perfect name for Warhol in the 60s, the combination of Dracula and Cinderella. We were uh, outre, avant-garde. Nobody wanted his artwork at the time. Silver goes with stars. It's the underground in New York City, Manhattan. And it's, it's something you can't recreate, as when we were making films there with the actual people there, making art there with the actual people there. That's my cat, Ruby. Imagine living and working in a place like that. It's so cool, isn't it? OK, I was born Isabelle Conan Dufresne, and I became ultraviolet in 1963 more or less, when I met Andy Warhol. Then I turned totally violet, from my toes to the tip of my hair. And to this day, what's amazing, you know, I'm, I'm aging, but my hair is naturally turning violet. It's all natural, which is quite extraordinary. Maybe it's a miracle. I'm Taylor Mead. And I'm buried alive in museums, cinematheques, and foundations. And with the Andy Warhol Foundation, we have a lot of wonderful movies with great character and personality, and even almost a plot. And we were all drama queens. We had, like, the Silver Factory was the place to throw our tantrums, uh, show our outfits just blossom. I'm a cult star. I'm a cult star because of uh, when I was with Warhol in New York, I, I was probably the only person there who was also a very good actor, who was an actress and, and thought she was going to be an actress, not just a star. I got very, very strange roles because of it. Um, eating Raoul, where I was a mass murderer. If somebody wants to be in movies, you can buy their life and say, uh, I, I, you know, we'll do two movies of your life for that year. But it's not even acting. I impersonated Andy in that whole jazz. They actually believe I look like him. And they believe that I am just like him, probably, except that I don't have money, <laughs> or maybe. I am Victor Barkas. I am a biographer and a portrait writer. I would say that the factory, from the moment it opens its doors, was the most intelligent art commune in the world. Here was another very high level think tank sort of um, communal, artistic uh, gathering place, you know. We were all people who had this divine will welling inside of us, driving us, saying, art, 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 you just have to create, create, create. It doesn't matter what you do, if you paint or dance or make music, use everything. But in New York, in the village, you are free to create. In, in that era, which was 1957, 1958, the village was the Bohemian Greenwich Village. It was the village. Washington Square Park was filled with bongo drum players. All the clubs had jazz musicians who did heroin and smoked marijuana. 
and you could hang out with these people and just groove. So Ginsburg and Corso and, and uh, Burroughs and, and the whole clique were the equivalent to art culture, what Marlon Brando and James Dean were to film culture. And in the authentic cultural world, the kings were the poets. Allen Ginsberg and Jack Kerouac were reading that night. Uh, or they weren't actually reading, they were talking their poetry. And Taylor Mead read his poem, The Statue of Liberty. Give me your tired, your poor, and let me blow them. Well, we were all protesting. It was a revolutionary time. And a uh, great many people from the Midwest and the West, disinherited people like me, came to New York to the coffee houses. And it was Bob Dylan and uh, Allen Ginsberg and uh, Gregory Corso, and we were uh, outre, avant-garde, super <laughs> But when we came to New York, the, 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 the whole cinema horizon opened. You could see everything, the classics, the past, the present, the, the experimental. The, uh, there was, there was, it was so rich already that we submerged ourselves completely and immediately into it. Like any art, cinema has the narrative aspect and the poetic aspect. And uh, so-called underground filmmakers are exploring the poetic aspect of cinema. So I've just finished a portrait of a friend of mine, poet Michael McClure, and uh, I tried very hard in that uh, portrait to, uh, to get not only the sense of the man, as I know personally, but some sense of his poetics. Before we knew it, there was no way back out of it. We were in, in it. And that is, was the beginning. By late October, new models rolled off the assembly lines. The recession was definitely over. One business really boomed. It's 1963 and the bust is big. But when he features Jane Mansfield, Hefner gets busted for obscenity. Genius is a kind of a funny word, uh, I suppose. Uh... It's very realistic. Now, really, who turned off to reality? About films. Yeah, I understand because uh, everything you take is real. It's right. It's real. Well, I met Andy. I was a, a just paying my rent by being a waiter in a uh, very posh boutique uptown on the Upper East Side in Manhattan called Serendipity Three. It's still the posh boutique, and the founder, Stephen Bruce, but Andy wasn't famous yet. Andy and Serendipity became, what should we say, connected very early. We opened in 1954, and he discovered us, I think, within the next six months. We were down in the basement. He just stumbled down with a portfolio of rejects, and uh, I was there just waiting for him with open arms. Andy was very generous. He did about 35 uh, uh, portraits uh, of me and uh, dozens of uh, shoe things, which I've kept myself and I have in my apartment. I had a lot of Andy Warhol work for sale at $25 and $50 a shoe drawing. Gay wasn't the word then, you know, but it was mostly faggots. <laughs> Everybody was who was successful. I mean, there's no, there's no really kind term to express the homosexual world before the gay revolution happened, you know, but it was a subculture because everybody was so terrified and paranoid all the time of losing their jobs at the time, you know. The, the Silver Factory did allow not only gay people, but straight, sexually oriented people 
you know, or let's just say living people to come out into the open and say, hey, I'm alive. This is my talent. This is my skill. And I'm going to show you what I'm doing. So, so the Warhol factory really was very instrumental in allowing those revolutions to happen and become known. The Silver Factory definitely has periods, and, and one of the least known periods is that early period. He started to make films, but it's not known yet, so he's still seen as an artist. Three years after I graduated high school, I uh, met Andy Warhol, and uh, he asked me to come to work for him. And so what started out as a summer job, because I was in college at the time, ended up being a job for about seven years. I had no sense of who Andy was, except that when I went back to his, his house the first day after we, we worked together, I saw some of, the, some of his Campbell's soup can artworks in, in the living room. It was the right time to, to turn the spotlight of commerciality on, back on to the uh, corporations. And say, instead of this Campbell's soup can, it, w it won't cost you 25 cents, it'll cost you $2,500. And people, people bought it. I think the rich like to be slapped in the face a little bit. Andy said, Billy, I just got this great loft uptown, and would you do what, do to my loft what you've done to your apartment? It was very decrepit, the walls, were concrete, the floors were concrete, and the walls were crumbling concrete. He wanted the loft to be totally silver, and Andy had set up a painting area in the front of the loft where windows were, because he could only paint in the daytime when the sunlight came in because there were no electrical outlets installed. Early Jackie paintings, Jackie Kennedy. They were not shown in New York when they were first produced because it was the year that Jack Kennedy, the president, was killed. And these are pictures from her widowhood series. So uh, no one would show them in New York because they thought it was bad taste. Andy relied upon Billy very much. He lived in the factory. He, he was the only person who was allowed to live there. And, uh, and he was the, the gatekeeper and the key man and the and everything. He was the manager of the factory, and he was um, sort of an equivalent to Gerard in many ways. He was very good looking. Um, he was, he had this, the new look, you know. And uh, he loved Andy. Um, he, he, I think that they had a very, very brief little liaison dangereuse. Andy and I had been for a time lovers, so we were intimately synchronized. I was the one who with Andy created the factory and made it, and we loved each other, and I'm talking about in the true artistic sense, you know, and we loved what we were doing, and it was so fluid, and, and I had the skills that he needed to free him to make the art, and, and then I could make my art as the arena. That whole thing started to break down somewhat when people from the outside came in to something that had already gelled and we're expecting something from it. Andy needed an established photojournalist because these, that group of, that were surrounded him, people who were gay, people who were queer, people who were not going to get into a major magazine. And I had that an entree, and uh, Andy wanted to break out of the New York culture womb and go nationwide, so it was kind of like a, mar 